Denmark. Okay, well, let's start by looking at my most negative thought about intimate relationships is, just listen for the answer. My most negative thought about intimate relationships is, we're gonna breathe that out today. And my biggest problem in intimate relationships is, which may be a different answer or the same answer, my biggest problem in intimate relationships could be sex, communication, whatever. Or it may be the same answer you got before. My biggest problem in intimate relationships, and you want to breathe those out today. Now, I can't do a good job talking about holy relationships until I get you clear on what is a special relationship and what is an unholy relationship. And that might take me quite a bit of time, so I may not get to the topic of holy relationships till next time. I'm trying to give you everything The Course in Miracles says on this topic, and it has a lot to say in the text, so I don't know if I'll get time to do it all. But we'll start out by talking about what is an unholy relationship. You have to know that before you can let it go so you can have a holy relationship. So the Course calls it an unholy relationship is what the Course calls a special relationship. Start breathing now in your upper chest, so taking in what I'm saying. It says the whole unholy relationship is the ego's chief weapon for keeping you from happiness. As long as you're indulging in the unholy relationship, you're not going to be happy. Most people are stuck in that and they think it's normal. Uh, it starts with the idea that we're searching for a perfect person to fix us and our psychic wounds. We want somebody, we need someone to fix us. So we look for somebody special and that means different, therefore separate. Therefore it's a relationship based on fear. And we're looking for one special person, one part of the sonship who will complete us and make us feel good. And we're trying to fill a lack in ourselves that we think we're lacking something this means we're seeking salvation in separation rather than oneness or wholeness. Uh, when we thought we were separate, which we all thought when we took a body, we must be separate from God, we began to feel a huge gaping hole within ourselves. And the ego argued that the love we needed must come from someone else and there must be one special person out there who can fill up this hole. And this desire symbolizes the separation and the guilt we feel because of it. So we're guilty about being separate and we have this hole and then we want to fill it by finding one special person, but that makes us feel more guilty. So the whole thing becomes about guilt. This is why people have so much anger in their close relationships because they're guilty that they're separate and looking for another person to fill their needs. So we're then projecting onto someone else, our partner, the rage we feel against ourselves because we've cut off from our own love with, with God. We've cut off from our own love and we're guilty about that. And then we are angry at ourselves for doing that. And then we project that onto our mate. So, the Course says the special relationship is based not on love, but on guilt. It starts with guilt, and then when you have guilt, you have fear, because you have a fear of guilt demands punishment. The minute you have guilt, you're going to have fear of being punished, and then you're going to be angry about the whole thing. So, a special unholy relationship has guilt, fear, and anger all the way through it. And it's a seduction, it's a seductive pill this this seduction of this holy unholy relationship uh, is really taking us away from God and we're spending all our time trying to work out this unholy relationship and it doesn't work out and then we're spending all our time on that trying to fix it trying to work it out trying year after year and then that we forget about God so the Course is very strong. It says it's a major form of idolatry. 
Now, idolatry is when you make up an idol that's away from God. So you're taking your relationship and turning it into an idol. And you're tempted to think something other than God can complete you. Oh, God's not completing me. I'm not complete. I need this one person to complete me and give me peace. And this ego is always going to tell you there's a special person out there who's going to make all your pain go away. If I fall in love with this one special person, all my pain will go away. That's the thought. But it doesn't work. Uh, it never works. It, the, this special relationship doesn't take your pain away. And it makes other people's behavior too important. And, you know, it makes us think we need this person. And they're so important that it, this is like blind love. Uh, we come together and we're sharing our desperation. So it's based on the belief of internal emptiness. I'm empty. I'm alone. I need something. What can I do to fill this lack in myself? I mean, these things aren't conscious. This is all on the unconscious level. You're not going around saying that. But that's what your unconscious is saying. I need another person to fill this lack. And we're looking for something, but then when we find it, we sabotage it anyway. We find what we have found, we sabotage it. So the ego is not looking for someone to love. It is looking for someone to attack, believe it or not. And it, the, the ego is saying, seek love, but make sure you never find it. Now that's the trap of the ego. You're always looking for love, but at the same time, you're making sure you never find it. So then you're always frustrated, always frustrated. <laughs> so here's what it says. An unholy relationship is based on differences where each one thinks the other has what he has not. I don't have this thing and I need to find somebody who has what I don't have. And they come together to complete himself and rob the other person. Well, this other person I'm falling in love is, uh, has these qualities that I don't think I have. I need to steal them and then move on. So they wander through a world of strangers, but they end up a world apart. So the ego is going to do everything it can to block this experience of love in any form. The ego can't stand love. So it's going to push away love once you get it. It's not your job to seek love. It's your job to seek all the barriers you hold against it to be removed. So let's look at this thought. My fear of love is, everybody say that to yourself. My biggest fear of love is, take a breath. This is where you're stuck. You have, you want love, you're craving it. And then when you get it, you have a fear of it. So you get rid of it. You push the person away or whatever. Or you find someone that's impossible to be with. When you turn your power of your happiness over to someone else, you're going to hate them for that. You know, I need this person to be happy, but I hate them because they are... <laughs> They're not letting me be happy myself. They can pull my strings. They can activate me. They can push my buttons. Why would you love someone who can make you miserable? That's how crazy an unholy relationship is. You love someone, but at the same time, you've attracted someone who makes you miserable. And then you sell out, and then you hate yourself for selling out. Oh, I can't leave this person because, you know, what would my mother say? What would my father say? What would anybody say? I have to stick it out and suffer. So most people are suffering in unholy relationships. Because if you're indulging in a special love, you're going to see yourself as deficient. I need this other person. I am somehow deficient. I'm empty. I'm incapable of fulfilling my own happiness by myself. And that's a terrible way to regard yourself. You're demeaning yourself by needing someone else to validate you. I need attention. I need, uh, and some people think attention is love. I had to correct somebody recently here with that. This person was craving attention. He thought that was love. I said, no, attention 
is not love. It's not the same. Do you want real love or you just want attention? <laughs> Why do we have the biggest blow offs with the people we are supposedly loving the most? Because the reason why it's not real love, it's a special love. Your hidden intention is to get something you believe you cannot get for yourself. And as long as your partner delivers the goods, you're going to love them. So we're always hoping to find the special someone who will save us from our low self-esteem and all of our unhappiness. So we get together with them and we expect them to save us from our unhappiness and they don't do it. They do not save us. They do not meet our needs. So now we have a burning resentment. I mean, this is all going on in conscious level, right? So now you're getting angry because they're not saving you. They're not giving you all the happiness that you thought they were going to give you because you think you need to get happiness from outside and they're not doing it. So you're, the problem is you're not even relating to the person in front of you, but a fantasy version. So what that means is they simply remind you of your past and we select people who remind us of the shadow figures of our past. So we always say this in the LRT that shadow figures guide our selection of mates. So what that means is we choose mates who is like one of the parent we had the most trouble with. And that's what you do. And even the Course in Miracles talks about that. They call it shadow figures. Um, then we put on a play that kind of reenacts the whole past. And then we're miserable. Because we, did, we, didn't we didn't have a good relationship with our parents because they didn't handle their case. They never went to therapy. They never got rebirths. And so they're dumping all their stuff on the family. And then you are attracted to what you can't... Uh, stand this is why it's so crazy you couldn't stand this parent so you end up attracting a mate who's like the parent you had the most trouble with that is crazy why do we do that unconsciously we're trying to learn forgiveness so i always tell people if you don't forgive your parents you're going to keep attracting one of your parents the parent you had the hardest time with now you would think you would marry the parent that was the easy one but that, that's not usually how it goes some people get their mother in one marriage and then they get their father in the next marriage. So you have to know which shadow figure from your past are you attracting. Could be your nanny, could be your obstetrician, whoever you're angry at. So this is called the special relationship. In, in other words, in an unholy relationship, it's not the body of the other with whom union is attempted but the body of those who are not even there. That's the crazy thing. It's called phantoms of the past. You're trying to attempt joining with someone who's not even there, which is one of your parents. See, what reminds you of your past, this is the point. What reminds you of your past grievances actually attracts you. Now that's a heavy statement, but you have to hear this admit it and choose out of this pattern what reminds me of my past grievances actually attracts me this is straight out of the course of miracles jesus talking i always said this in the lrt but i never worded it quite as strongly as that what reminds me of my past grievances actually attacks me attracts me that's why i'm always telling people if you don't want to attract your parents you have to totally forgive them because forgiveness is the master erase So I'm feeling guilty, but what makes me feel better is to put you down. That's, that's what's going on in a special relationship. I don't want to face my own guilt, but I feel better if I can project it onto you and put you down. And I'm aware something's bothering me, but the only way I can get rid of it is to attack you. That's why special relationships have so much anger and attack in them because the ego is savage and special relationships are brutal. Now you're more attracted to pain than love by falling, by you falling down, then I feel elevated. So if I can put you down, my mate, find everything wrong with you, then I feel more powerful, I feel elevated. 
So the whole point that I'm saying is the ego mind is a battlefield addicted to conflict. If I get things from you, I'll love you. But if I don't get what I want from you, I'm going to hate you. So the whole, if you're into an, your ego with a, a special relationship, it's going to be a battlefield and you're going to be addicted to conflict. Then you make a codependent bargain. Well, I'm going to be dependent on you. And that means I can be helpless. You're going to be taking care of me. And that means you are dominant. So then you end up with somebody controlling you. Well, what if each person is saying that? No, I'm going to be dependent and you're going to take care of me. And then nobody's taking care of anybody. And then they get angry and then they get upset and then they want to leave. So you're transferring to others the ownership of your soul and you're giving this other person exclusive rights to you. The main problem here is the responsibility for one's misery is shifted to the other person. You're responsible for my misery. But then you attacking them, then you're going to feel more guilty because every time you get angry at someone or get real judgmental, you're going to get guilty and then you're going to get screwed up from your guilt. The more we attack other people, the guilty we're going to feel. But the problem is we're blaming the other partner for our misery. That's what people do in a special relationship. So in a special relationship, you know, everybody's trying to have a perfect face. Um, then you call it a good relationship if the other person behaves the way you want them to behave and never presses your buttons. So here's the summary. In the special love relationship, your partner is your savior, your idol. You worship them. Then it turns into a special hate relationship and your partner becomes your enemy. That's the result of an unholy relationship. And you have to face it. The Course in Miracles says, before you can ever go to a holy relationship, which I will discuss next time. But the main point I want you to get, and this is pretty heavy. I just figured this out after reading the course again, the special in the special relationship, you're equating yourself with the ego and not with God. And if you are in an unholy relationship where you're not happy, you are also in an unholy relationship with God. And an unholy relationship leads to death. Now that is, I've never said that before, but I just found that in the course somewhere in the text. We're trying to review the text, Marcus and I, every morning. And every time I read it, I feel something I, I never heard of before. This statement I'm going to repeat. If you are in an unholy relationship where you're not happy, you are also in an un unholy relationship with God and an unholy relationship leads to death. That says that right in the course. <laughs> well, I just told that to somebody that I'm, I'm working with that I know is in an unholy relationship. And he was so shocked. And he said, well, is there any chance of turning it into a holy relationship? I says, I said, yes, there is. But you and your wife both have to face it. And you'd have to understand what an unholy relationship is and read the course and change it. And he said, oh, I can't talk to her about that. <laughs> so what can I do? My hands are tied with this couple. He can't even talk to his wife about the fact that he believes they are in an unholy relationship. And he's facing it because I'm pressuring him to face it, but she doesn't want to look at it. So what chance do we have here? That was That's what happens when one partner wants to work on themselves and is willing to look at this, everything I'm saying, and the other one isn't willing to look at this. How is that going to work? So you need to find somebody who's willing to work on themselves and willing to hear this lecture and you both have to face it if one of you is facing it and the other is not going to face it how is that going to work okay so anyway the holy relationship which we're going to talk about next time is where each one looks within and sees no lack and they accept their completion and then they join with another who's also complete and they share the light with the world it's a totally different ball of wax, totally different ball of wax. And both are giving up their errors gladly to correction. So we'll talk about that next time. Let's start breathing on everything I said. The first thing you have to do is breathe out your addiction to the unholy relationship. Breathe out your addiction. 
All right, put your hands down to your side, please, so it's easier to move your chest. Open your mouth wider. Let's breathe out our addiction to an unholy relationship. You can have a holy relationship. It's totally possible, and Jesus is here to help us do it. I hope Sandra inspired you to come next week, <laughs> and she only gave you half the picture. Uh, it was a lot to cover, and I think she's right. We have to understand the depth of what a special relationship is and how self-destructive it is before we can sort of cry uncle and say, yes, it's time to change this and have a holy relationship. And there are certain things that Sandra and I did when we first got together. And I think that that's also the key that you establish a holy relationship in the very beginning. You don't wait to let it evolve on its own. You have to have certain principles uh, that you employ at the very beginning. And one of the principles we started with was we both agreed that we wanted a relationship free of conflict. So we actually made that agreement from the very start. And we said that um, conflict-free relationship is the most important for us. And we stuck with that. It doesn't mean that things aren't gonna come up because they will. Sometimes you do have a disagreement where you're not seeing things uh, in the same light, but you've both agreed not to argue about it. And you've both agreed to use the techniques uh, to come to a higher thought. And when you have a potential disagreement, you have to both be willing to drop your position and, and give up the need to be right. Which would you rather have, peace or being right? So you have to give up this need to be right, and then you both have to explore, well, what's the highest thought in this issue that we're having uh, you know, a disagreement about? So there are things that you can do to get out of the conflict, but you have to first agree that you're, you're not gonna put up with conflict. And that's, that's the first agreement we made in our quote unquote, holy relationship. And we also agreed on certain spiritual practices. You know, we were both students of the Course in Miracles. We were both uh, rebirthers. Um, we were both dedicated to our ascension, our spiritual life. We put our spiritual life in the first place. So there are certain conditions that when you establish in the beginning, uh, they're the basis for a holy relationship. So our sacred life was more important than anything else. And then we transferred that passion into other things, you know, our work, our finances, our intimacy, but you have to have the sacredness in the first place. And I think that's the key to a holy relationship. So we'll discuss that more next week. We hope you'll join us again uh, to go more in depth in, in the holy relationship aspect of this lecture. And so, but in the meantime, I'd listen to this, this lecture that Sandra gave on the special relationship again, because we have to get real clear how it is we sabotage ourselves. How is it that we make up these special relationships that don't don't bring the happiness that we thought they should. So we have to be really clear about the dynamics of that. And that's why the, the, there's nothing like The Course in Miracles that describes this special relationship. And yes, indeed, forgiveness is the master race. And we have to forgive ourselves. We have to forgive all of our exes. We have to forgive our parents, our siblings and any other major figure in our life, uh, because that lack of forgiveness is gonna infiltrate our relationships that we have now. So forgiveness is the key to happiness. We'll, we'll discuss that more next week.